Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center in School, the Army's Special Operations Center of Excellence. For our SWIC Heritage Week, Major General Healy Distinguished Lecture Series Guest Lecture with Mr. Dan Carlin. The lecture series is named in honor of uh, Major General Michael Iron Mike Healy, who served as the 12th Commandant and Commanding General of the Special Warfare Center from 1973 to 1975. Michael Healy enlisted in the Army at the end of World War II at the age of 19. His distinguished 35-year career included combat operations in the Korean War and commanding special forces throughout five and a half tours of duty in Vietnam. General Healy's military honors include three distinguished service medals, two silver stars, the Legion of Merit, Distinguished Flying Cross, seven bronze stars with valor, and two purple hearts. His legendary career in special forces earned him the title Iron Mike. He was also the inspiration for John Wayne's character, Colonel Mike Kirby, in the 1968 movie, The Green Berets. And most notably, Major General Healy was inducted as a distinguished member of the Special Forces Regiment in 2015. The ceremony will hold again tomorrow. Our distinguished lecturer today is Mr. Dan Carlin. Dan Carlin is an American podcaster, political commentator, and amateur historian. Whether he's discussing history or current events, veteran journalist Dan Carlin brings his own unconventional approach to the subject matter. His Generation X nonpartisan neo prudentist outlook provides a fresh look at the headlines in the newspapers and the stories in the history books. His two podcasts, Hardcore History and Common Sense, are two of the leading independent podcasts in their respective genres. Both productions feature Carlin's unique, contradictory broadcast style, passionate without being aggressive, loud but smart, and his trademark fast staccato vocal delivery has been compared to William Shatner after too many espressos. Mr. Carlin has asked for a question and answer style engagement today, and we have some prepared questions. But I encourage all of you to take the opportunity and to, to ask questions of Mr. Carlin. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge and will offer incredible insight. Um, for those here in the room, please, as soon as you think of a question, come to one of the mics in the, uh, the two aisles here, line up, and, uh, and we'll get to you before we ask our prepared questions. And for those joining us via Zoom, I do ask that you keep your mics muted so we don't have any feedback issues. Please enter your questions into the chat. I will be monitoring and, and moderating that and uh, asking those questions of, uh, of Dan as they come up. Uh, so before... Uh, Let's uh, first give our, uh, our guests a warm round of applause. Thank you very much for joining us. Before we get into the question and answer, we're going to have a few opening remarks from the U.S. Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School Commanding General, Brigadier General Will Beaupair, sir. Okay. Hey, Dan, can you hear me okay? I can't. Sorry for the lateness. We had a minor Zoom uh, late crisis here. I apologize. No, it's great. We've got you uh, loud and clear, and we were corralling a few uh, of our folks in the room anyways, so uh, I think the timing works out perfectly. Dan, thanks again. Thanks again for, uh, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate you, uh, you being with us today. I know you, you ideally would like to be here in person, and we discussed that earlier. Unfortunately, logistically, that wasn't feasible for, uh, for Dan today, but to the, to the audience writ large here, uh, you know, you've got a unique opportunity here to have a, a very deep, informed dialogue about history. Uh, and I think it's, it's very relevant to where we are as an institution. Uh, as Dan and I discussed, we're celebrating our heritage here at SWIC uh, this, uh, this week. That'll culminate on, uh, on Friday with our ball. Uh, but uh, the entire week has been dedicated to recognizing where we came from, our past, our lineage, our history, our heritage. Uh, and I think this is a great way midweek on day three of our Heritage Week uh, to talk about uh, how history matters and why it matters. Uh, and uh, having talked to Dan earlier, I, I will tell you he's, uh, he's willing to talk about any range of topics, right? No holds bar here. Uh, Chatham House rules though. Uh, just, you know, I think uh, we have an opportunity to be very candid and very, very frank in our dialogue here today. And I, I'd encourage you all to do that as you ask your questions. Uh, so you just should already start lining up behind those microphones to ask those questions. I'm not seeing anybody move, uh, but there's one already. All right, good. We got some volunteers. But uh, it, it just, uh, just remember that um, as we think about where we've been, there's a lot of things that we can learn from our past and our history. And I would tell you right now, geostrategically across the world, especially for the students in the room, because you hear it every day in your classes from your cadre and your instructors. We are in a very, very 
difficult, ambiguous, uncertain strategic environment with uh, a pacing challenge from one threat in the Indo-Pacific and an acute challenge right now that is very relevant in the UCOM theater, right? And so if you're not thinking about that right now, I'd ask you to just kind of get, uh, get, get your head in the right frame of mind because we have some very, very difficult challenges. But I'll tell you, if you look at history, there are things that we have seen in history that probably give us an indication uh, of how we as military professionals could think about these problems uh, looking on our past. So with that said, Dan, we've already got one volunteer for a question. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to give you maybe an opportunity up front uh, to make a couple introductory comments. So over to you, Dan. Thanks again for joining us. Well, my introductory comments not going to have anything to do with, with, with what you guys think. But I, I'm having uh, audio issues on your end where I can't, where you guys are cutting out. So I'm missing some of what you're saying. So if I ask anyone in the audience to repeat the question, I apologize. I'm not getting all of the audio on your end. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, but I'm honored to be here and I'm honored to talk with you. And the reason to have a Q&A in this discussion is I'm hoping to answer the kind of things that matter to you folks. So uh, with that having been said, happy to talk about anything. Uh, you guys do important work and I have a feeling considering the sort of uh, national and international threats we face as a country, I think some of what you guys do is gonna be more important than maybe it's been in a very long time. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Carlin. I don't know if you can hear me or if this microphone's even on. So can we get a sound check first? Turn it on. Yes, no? Turn it on. Is it? Oh, it's a, it's a me problem, of course. All right, how about now? One, two, three, can you, can you hear me? I, I can hear, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, well, first, uh, Mr. Carlin, uh, I'm Sergeant Bennett. I'm an intelligence analyst in a civil affairs battalion. Um, I'm a huge fan of your show, Hardcore History. Um, a couple of standout moments that have just stuck with me through the years as I've, uh, you know, interacted with your content. Uh, Mene Mene, Tuckle U. Farson stands out from your King of Kings series. Uh, and then also your uh, just brutal coverage of uh, the Japanese Empire and Man King. It's, it's incredible the way that you can bring forth these stories from humanity's past in a way that can just touch with an audience in a clearly understood way. Uh, one of the issues that I have come across in my career as an intelligence professional and working within uh, United States Special Operations uh, is working through the, the language barrier and how to actually make things connect on that human level. And my question is, uh, what is kind of your analytical thought process as you research these very human topics and how do you get it to translate so well to get the story told accurately with proper references and come across so well? Well, I have to admit that that was an evolution uh, because the original intent of the program was not to have those kinds of discussions. It was to simply talk about the really interesting, strange parts about these stories and assuming that the audience already knew the stories. And then as we went along, we realized, based on audience feedback, that they often didn't know the stories. And so we had to add more of the background context information so that the interesting aspects that we wanted to highlight had made sense, really. And so over time, it evolved into what you were just talking about, this, this need to dive deeper and create a framework so that these very human stories uh, had something to hang them on, right? So uh, the way we tend to look at it here is um, is that I feel like you need the high level stuff. So take the first World War show we did as an example. You need the background of what's going on in order for the stories that when you zoom in and you talk about the soldier who's wounded in the shell hole, who's writing his last letter to his family, the contents of which we have and that I'll use, it doesn't really have the same impact if you haven't told the whole story about you know, how this guy ended up in the shell hole. What's he doing there? What are the stakes, right? Um, and so that's sort of how, from an evolutionary standpoint, the show developed into a zoom in, zoom out, high level, ground level kind of approach. Um, 
we learned as we went, but my general guidance here is to take the parts of this story that I find interesting and then transmitting them. We figured that over time the audience self-selects and the people that like what I like continue to listen and those who don't, don't. So after a while we figured, well, if it, if it gets to me, it'll get to the audience as well. So basically I tell these stories and I take the parts out that have an impact on me emotionally or intellectually and we transmit those and the audience that continues to stay with the show are the people who also are impacted by those things. So I feel like if you're enjoying the show that you like the same things about the story that I do. Thank you very much, Mr. Collins. Thank you for the question. One note for uh, our questioners here. After you ask your question, please turn off the mic. Uh, because the, the feedback picks it up and switches the camera over to you. So if you turn off your mic, it'll stay on uh, Mr. Carlin while he provides a response. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, my name is Pat Smith. I'm a retired uh, psychological operations and I'm a officer, uh, current maritime archaeologist. Uh, and my question for you is this. Uh, in terms of cultural memory, um, in Celtic Colobus, I recall that, if I'm recalling right, five Ictus woe to the vanquished. Uh, and my question would extend to us as a special operations community is um, how cultures have long memory for things that long past wrongs and um, how they, uh, to put something we have an axe to grind for a long time and how that might affect relationships. Obviously, with the Romans, uh, they never forgot that sacking uh, by the Celts. Um, and the outlook is, in your experience with your research, have you found that with deep history where these grudges seem to last for centuries and affect uh, relations with uh, other nations? Well, absolutely. I mean, and, and it's on a case by case basis, obviously, but I mean, you see it even now. Uh, uh, I got into a little uh, discussion on Twitter with uh, Native American folks who are still. Uh, uh, very angry about uh, about conduct that happened 150 years ago, um, but but there's a sort of a, a cultural institutional memory as you spoke about where these sorts of things continue to have ripples of impact down the road. So what these Native American folks were saying is they're still living with the ramifications of those events from 150 years ago. And so, whereas many of us may have moved on from those sorts of things, uh, they're reminded about those events every day in one way or another. And I've often wondered about the Celtic people that you mentioned, how long after what, was, what we would call today a, a genocide or an ethnic cleansing or a conquest by the Romans, how long after that were the Celtic people still looking back on, a, on an independent past where you know, they could hearken back to things like traditions or uh, religious ceremonies or uh, cultural sorts of things which had been sub subsumed by, by, by Rome and, and that culture. How long were they looking back and romanticizing or trying to uh, uh, overturn? There was, I mean, I think there were Celtic rebellions for a couple of centuries after their conquest. And so maybe that's a, an ancient example of something that Native Americans today, for example, might be able to relate to, where um, it, it's easier for the conqueror to move on than the conquered, and I think that makes total sense. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I do think it's on a case-by-case -case basis. It depends on what's happened since the conquest and exactly how much of, um, well, I mean, look, you could even say something like what we see in Eastern Europe today with the Soviet Union's taking over those territories after the Second World War and how white hot the feelings of the people in, say, the Balkans are, I mean, the, the Baltic countries are now uh, from that sort of a, of a situation. I mean, uh, people remember. I don't know how many generations it takes for something like that to die out, but I think a cultural memory, especially in the case of the vanquished, tends to preserve those those things and keep those wounds from completely scabbing over, if you will. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Carl. I hope that makes sense. Yes, sir. Mr. Carl, can you hear me? I can, sir. Hi, I'm Johnny Searles. Uh, about this time last year, I was a student at National Defense University here on Fort Bragg and uh, I was writing a thesis about personnel policies. 
and uh, came across a lot of material regarding the draft. Um, now I'm a student at uh, professional development education, and I'm seeing more material about the draft. And uh, based on the stuff I've read and current recruiting crisis, um, I'm wondering what your perspective is on if the military is healthier when we have a draft, maybe a mixture of draft and volunteer. We tend to see the draft as this kind of awful thing. Um, but historically, it seems like that's the way it's been done. And I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Oh, that's a deep topic. Um, so it depends. I mean, it depends on whose perspective we're looking at. We're looking at it from the military's perspective, or we're looking at it on the impact it has on a society. Uh, I remember reading uh, Victor Davis Hansen's book uh, where he was talking about um, the, the conscript armies, or I think he called them the armies of freedom. And he, he used the Second World War U.S. Army as one of the examples of, um, of these armies that reminded us of, say, the Roman Republic's armies, where they would bring uh, the farmers into the army uh, during the Roman Republic, and slowly but surely they would be converted from citizen soldiers into professionals simply by the experience of combat. You know, uh, uh, if you take the U.S. Army in 1942 when it, uh, when it launches Operation Torch in North Africa and gets their first taste of Second World War combat against the Germans and gets uh, bloody in places like Kasserine Pass, um, that's a learning experience. But you compare that army to the 1945 army a mere three years later, and that army looks deadly and professional and bloody and experienced. And that's what uh, Hansen was talking about in terms of these conscript armies becoming uh, deadly professional armies. Now, the difference between that and a professional force, though, as I guess everyone in this audience probably knows about, is that um, we're in a high tech military now. We're in a place where, I mean, I was just reading something about uh, offering tanks to Ukraine and how how much of um, the learning curve is involved in integrating those systems, including everything from the logistics of providing for them, the uh, cooperation between the various arms, and, and everything that goes into that. If you have a professional military of people who train with this all the time, it's easier for groups of people who are professionals to come up to speed. You know, uh, Whereas, I mean, you don't have three years for the United States Army maybe to come up to speed in those kinds of situations. So when you talk about the draft, you're talking about bringing in a bunch of people that are going to take a while to get up to speed. Um, so I don't know if the draft is what the military would like. Now, if we look at society as a whole, well, there are interesting things to consider with the draft. Now, personally, um, I would say that I wouldn't be for something like that because I, I don't feel like I don't feel like if the country's not directly threatened that I want to see people forced into the military. At the same time, it's a form of public service that one could argue has benefits above and beyond simply the war fighting benefits. Um, I certainly think when you look at the effects that, say, the Second World War generation or the people that were drafted into the Korean War, what have you, I mean, those people had an impact on the society uh, for the rest of their lives. You know, they may have served for two, three, four years, but then the impact that they had for decades afterwards, both from what they learned, the way their mindset changed, their, their attitudes toward public service, all those sorts of things had, had an impact on the society as a whole that had nothing to do with war fighting. Um, I'm not smart enough uh, or well informed enough to talk about what those ramifications are in terms of, you know, do the benefits outweigh the drawbacks? Uh, I would say from a military standpoint, I think a professional army um, is one that you can put into harm's way more quickly and have it do a better job. So, for example, if something broke out tomorrow um, over Taiwan, uh, you wouldn't want to wait three years or two years to have a conscript army get up to speed. Um, you know, you want to have professionals who can hit the ground running. Um, but I'm not sure that in a republic like ours that there are societal benefits to having a whole bunch of people go through this route where they're, they feel like they're stakeholders in the society. And I think, uh, I think public service and military service helps create that sense of a stakeholder in the same way that, you know, being able to say I'm a taxpayer and I demand my rights gives you a stake 
uh, in, in the country as a whole. So I think there's societal benefit potentially to a draft. I think you have a better military without one, but maybe there's an argument to be made for a hybrid sort. If you look at the German army after the Versailles Treaty, where they were limited to 100,000 professional soldiers, and then you see how those 100,000 professional soldiers were used as a core to create a much larger army when the army was expanded and conscription was reintroduced. Those 100,000 soldiers from the um, from the Reichswehr force became the officers in the Wehrmacht. So there's an argument to be made that, that the you, you folks, the professionals, become the core of an army that gets expanded with conscripts later when you get into a war that requires five, six, seven million soldiers on the ground. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Thanks for taking my question. Thank you for your offer. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Carlin. My question is, I just read Stephen Tanner's Afghanistan, and I was wondering, the biggest takeaway I got from the book was essentially a lot of objectives of empires go there and stall. And I was wondering if you foresee Afghanistan continuing that, um, I guess, place in history. I think the short answer is yes. Um, I, I, I'm not a fan of the idea of nation building, and yet when you look at countries like Afghanistan, I think it's difficult to imagine nations like that coalescing in a way that creates the sort of stability that one would expect. And look, I, I have friends from Afghanistan who would say that, that in the not too distant past, they were more of the sort of uh, nation state that we would hope to have in terms of a, a stability creating sort of entity there. But I do think that sometimes when these places lack the basic elements, and sometimes when they're not unified enough to, you know, I mean, some of these countries that we go into might be better off as two or three, and I'm not speaking specifically about Afghanistan, but there's a lot of these places where Iraq is another example, where Iraq might really be three different countries. Um, and somebody once said that, you know, it takes a strong man like a Saddam Hussein to weld these places that don't necessarily want to be part of one place together. I'm reminded of the former Yugoslavia under a guy like Joseph Tito. And they said the same thing, that these are places that don't want to be united, but, but there's a, a, a force that keeps them that way. But when that force goes away, I think there's almost like a, like a natural um, drifting apart of these peoples that don't necessarily perhaps belong into the same borders. And a place like Afghanistan might be an example of that. I also think you have to take into account the powers around Afghanistan that may have their own reason for not wanting a unified, I mean, I mean, the reason the Soviets went into Afghanistan in the late 1970s was because they didn't like the government there. And then when they went in, of course, they had their own problems. So I, you know, there used to be a line, and I'm not going to use it, but they, they talked about the idea that some of these places are, are, are less national, modern day nation states than they are tribal confederations. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think. I think a place like Afghanistan is a perfect example of something that it would be very hard to imagine outsiders going in there and fusing the various entities in, in, in that place into a, a stable, uh, long-lasting state. And I think that a lot of the, the areas that the United States has found themselves, and to be honest, the old Soviet Union found themselves involved with, fall into that same category because the, it, it prompts an instability that leads to circumstances which may prompt outside intervention. I mean, I think you saw that in the Somalia situation uh, under the first George Bush administration. I mean, those kinds of things can create crises or genocides or starvations that sort of pressure countries to intervene. Um, and so I think Afghanistan is just one example. But I do think that that, I mean, I can't envision a scenario where the United States converted Afghanistan into the stable, a uh, self-sustaining nation state of the sort where we could just walk away and it could continue for the next, you know, 100 years in, in its form. Does that make sense? It does. It does, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Carlin. I appreciate your time. Like everyone else here, big fan. Um, thank you. Uh, just finished up re-listening to Death Goes to the Republic, so, so more sort of nerdy history question. What do you think the point of no return is for the Roman Republic? 
Is this sort of the moment Tiberius Gracchus is buying against the crown for scriptures? Or is it really not until the Augustan settlement that like the Republic is gone, you know, it's not coming back? Wow, that's a great question. I'm not sure I'm qualified to give the answer. I think, I think you know, I'm a fan of, of processes and using those as, as examples of things. And I think you can say the same thing, by the way, for our current situation in this country, where it's not a question of personalities, probably not even a question of leadership, but almost forces interacting on one another. And I think it's possible to, you know, for those who don't know, uh, the, the Gracchus brothers are one of those famous uh, uh, inflection points in the history of the Roman Republic, where oftentimes people see that as, as, as one of the moments where the Republic begins to show major fractures uh, that lead to Julius Caesar and the fall of the Republic later. But one can always find precursors. So when we did the fall of the Roman Republic show, we were pointing out that even the two Gracchus brothers had precursors, Saturninus, people like that, who were the, let's call them the proto Um, So I don't know where the point of no return is, and I don't know when, when leadership could have made a difference. I think you have multiple strands, uh, including immense amounts of wealth. I think that the fact that you have generals starting to have armies that owe their allegiance to the generals rather than to the Roman Senate, um, there's a whole bunch of these things that come together um, that create a destabilization process. And that process just seems to get worse. And I think, you know, we always talk about sometimes you feel like you're able as a leader or as a Senate or whatever that you can, that you can push historical events in directions where you want them to go. But sometimes history starts to pull. And, and the moment between when you're actually pushing events and when they start to pull, is one of those things where you can't really tell when you're living through. But at a certain point, you lose control of the process and you're along for the ride. And I don't know when that moment happens in the Roman Republic. I would argue that maybe by the time Tiberius or Caius Gracchus uh, die, that maybe the die, to quote Julius Caesar, the die is already cast and, and it would be impossible to disentangle the rope. What's the old line with the Gordian knot and, and, and Alexander the Great? He comes to the Gordian knot, and the old line is that the guy who can untie the Gordian knot gets to be the ruler. And the old legend is that Alexander just takes his sword and cuts the Gordian knot. I don't know at what point you could still untie the Gordian knot of the of the thing, things that were destroying the Roman Republic. Um, I think, by, if you ask me, I think by the time the Gracchi are around the nut is pretty well tied. And uh, and had they not lived, you would have had people like them because you had people before them like Sacrifice and these precursors. Uh, and I think Julius Caesar, maybe you could look at as the last of the Gracchi. Uh, and I think by the time Augustus is around, I don't think Augustus even wants to restore the Republic. And I'm not sure the Romans in the time period wanted that either because by the time the Republic fell, we had so much civil war, so many executions, so many Romans dying, so much political instability. I think they were tired at that point. We're looking just for a little long-term stability. I think the empire provided that. I appreciate your answer, sir. Unfortunately, I'm here with a friend who constantly looks down on me and my belief in great man theory of history. Uh, you've given him enough ammunition to essentially win every future argument. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Sorry, sorry to intervene in that uh, personal dispute. <laughs> hey, Dan. Uh, my name is uh, Major General Patrick Roberson. I'm the Deputy Commander for the U.S. Army Special Operations Command. So, first of all, thank you for being here. Thanks for doing this for the Special Warfare Center School. I think most people here are big fans, and uh, we all appreciate you know, your scope and scale of history. So thank you for doing what you do, you really, I'm, I'm a big fan, I know a lot of guys are big fans. Uh, we think about your work and we work to do our work, so appreciate that. Sorry for being late again, I appreciate the comments, thank you. Oh no, no, it's okay, I, thank you for being late. You know, we all got things to do, it's all right. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the, I have a question, you, you have a great, you know, look back in time, you have history, your scope is tremendous. We are all the full audience, really part of a uh, 
a lineage of people that are in basically the U.S. Army's, you know, elite forces, special forces, ranger regiments, you know, some of our aviators, the 160, and all these different elements of really elite forces. You probably look back in time and you can say, what do you think the contribution of elite forces are in an army? I've seen some of your comparison work between the World War I Army of Germany, the uh, World War II Army of the Confederate, I thought that was great. But if you look back over time and you say, hey, which armies had some great elite forces? If you think about that, I'm curious what you think about that contribution, and then if you could comment on what do you think about the U.S. military's elite forces? Could be SEALs, Rangers. What do you see, what do you think? How do you evaluate them? Over. Oh, wow, okay. Um, well, first of all, you know, it, it depends on how we define their new forces, and I'm not sure something like the Rangers or the Green Berets uh, are anything like some of the elite forces, say, in the ancient world. So, for example, if I go to the ancient Achaemenid Persians, which are one of the, the groups of people I've always been fascinated with, they come from a tradition where there was a household elite force known as the Mortals. Uh, 10,000 supposedly elite soldiers who were professionals. In, in, that, in those systems in the ancient Near East, as we used to call them anyway, um, those form the core of the army. And we were just talking about the difference between, say, how um, the between the wars during the military, which was uh, confined to 100,000 soldiers, was able to expand and use that 100,000 as the core of a much larger army later. In the ancient Near East, it was the same way. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the ancient Persians all had similar systems where they had a core army of elites, or the immortals, 10,000 men, and then when the army fielded a, a full multinational force for making field battles, that core formed the elite fragment force that was then expanded multiple times over by what we would call either conscripts or local elite forces from provinces. So that's a very different thing than having, say, some of the kinds of forces that the Romans, for example, would have had, where they would have had something much closer to like a Green Berets or a Rangers or something like that, where they could take, I mean, the Empire had some of these forces where uh, these elites could go in there and be involved in insurgency warfare, or uh, like many of you do, uh, align with, uh, with local elites or uh, tribal forces and help lead them in ways that, that you know, as auxiliaries that would help, or we would say today, advisors uh, that could go in and, um, and, and take Roman policy. In the Byzantines had this thing where you'd send in elite forces who would basically use uh, the, the militaries of other people to, uh, to, to fight and, and, and what's the word I'm looking for here? To, to, to extend the policy decisions of the Byzantine leadership without having to send their own armies into these areas, because sometimes it didn't make sense to send their own armies into these areas. So I think if we're trying to compare today's kinds of special forces, elite forces, they may be different from a lot of the societies in the past. Um, I think what, what you guys do is much more similar to what you saw the Romans do, or I mean, I even think of Napoleonic forces, or um, say the British during the Revolutionary War had a bunch of different units that might be compared to, uh, to SEALs, Rangers, uh, 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 Green Berets, and that kind of thing. So I always think that those forces are important because a military leader or a political state always needs to have something that they can send into these areas where they know that they have high quality, well-trained, um, and highly motivated specialists to go in and do things that they really have no one else capable of doing those same kinds of missions for. So I would suggest that this is something that goes back as far as armies go back. But I do think that different military systems have different sorts of elite forces and use them in different ways. I can also say that there may be um, there may be versions of, let's just say, the Green Berets in ancient Achaemenid Persia or ancient Assyria that we're not aware of. Um, you know, sometimes the records don't always illuminate what a lot of these militaries had. I mean, it's only in, I mean, in the 1980s when I was building war games armies from some of these ancient uh, societies, we knew hardly anything about them. We know much more now. So maybe over time, some of these elite forces would become more known to us. I, I can think of certain uh, certain groups that it, were in the ancient Assyrian army that might be compared with the British Gurkha forces and things like that. So I would suggest that this is probably an age-old element in militaries because there's always been a need. And when there's a need, 
you know, there's there's always some solution found in that. And I think Green Jersey, Green Berets, and all those things form something that every military finds themselves in need of from time to time. Does that make sense? No, awesome. I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate it. That was great. Great response. Thank you. Keep up good work. Well, thanks for the questions. Thank you. You too. Hey, Mr. Tarlin, huge fan. Appreciate your time. Um, I was wondering if uh, you, if history provided uh, an insight or, um, you know, uh, into the situation with China and Taiwan. Being that the, uh, traditionally China has never been an expansionist society. It never has wanted, it's never wanted to take over mass pieces of land at once. It's always kind of insular. And I was wondering, uh, you know, is, based on that, is, uh, you know, and it's, I, I wouldn't expect you to know this, but, uh, specifically, but based on that, would you predict that uh, China, um, the Chinese military to be more of an economic warfare, or are there any other, are there any insights on them, you know, waging an actual hot war? Well, you know, there have been periods in time when China uh, expansion, you know, we think of expansion as the conquest and addition of territory. But the United States is a perfect example of a state that, it, that does what I think China did during certain periods in history. So there's a famous expedition that happened around the same time as the Roman Empire was around uh, by a Chinese general named Van Chao, who launched expeditions of uh, well, it would be westward from China, and at one point, and this is one of the fascinating stories, they came within only a couple hundred miles of the most eastern outposts of the Roman Empire. And one of the great what ifs is, what if those two had come into contact? But the reason for this Chinese general's move into that direction wasn't to conquer these territories, it was to sort of overawe the various tribal peoples in that area and, and get them to be uh, whether or not they want it to be sort of allies or dependencies of China. So when you have as much territory as China has always had, uh, and especially back in earlier periods where it's much harder to police those kinds of territories where communications are much more difficult, I don't think you necessarily need more territory, just like I don't think the United States needs more territory, but sometimes you need friendly states on your border. Uh, or, or, or places that you know, the Byzantines used to do this forever, which is to have these places as buffer states who could go, uh, you know, if you have a hostile tribe on your border or you have one of these states that you could have go take care of them for you, well, then you don't have to do that. So I think what the Chinese were trying to do in very much of their history is to make sure that they had a secure area around their territory that they knew were either client states or submissive territories or allies. Um, and I think you could make a case that when we look at something like Taiwan, or the, you know, everybody knows that China is creating these uh, artificial islands off into the uh, South China Sea and places like that. That may be much more about, say, resources. Um, and, and I mean, we see that with uh, Russia in, in the melting areas of the Arctic too, that the oil and uh, lithium is now a big thing everybody's interested in and those kinds of things. Um, so when you look at something like that, I think, if not just that, let me expand it outward to, to having more diplomatic relations. I mean, China's going around and doing a lot of things in Africa and places like that that we're famous for doing and that the Soviets used to do, where uh, you give a lot of money to places, you uh, foster development, but that creates ties of uh, dependency. Um, so I think that's the sort of thing that, that states with tons of territory do rather than take over other areas. The whole Taiwan thing, um, that, that's, a, that's a little difficult issue. It's hard for me to factor in things like national pride into these sorts of things. It's also hard for me to figure uh, how something like a Taiwan might be seen by China as something like a Cuba is seen to us. Um, so, so I think to answer your question, I don't think of China as expansionistic in the traditional sense of the word. They're not like Nazi Germany, where they're going to take over a bunch of territory to create Lebanon's realm. The Chinese don't need any more Lebanon's realm, but they do need diplomatic contacts. They do want to have influence around the world. It's the same thing that the Chinese general Han Chao was trying to do, also. Um, so, so I think they're following a sort of a playbook that we've been very good at executing ourselves. 
Now the problem is, is when you have countries that already do this, like if we're, if we're in Africa, for example, which we are, trying to do similar things, what happens when our needs and, uh, and national interests in a place like that that we've been working towards get confronted by Chinese, uh, um, for lack of a better word, what we call NGOs or whatever, are doing a similar sort of thing. Um, so I think China's following the playbook that, that giant nation states do, and I would suggest that Russia is doing something that doesn't seem very much like that, right? They, they do seem to be going back to territorial expansion, which if you look at a map, Russia's the largest country in the world. So why they would need more territory, more resources, doesn't seem to make any sense. So I would say that China, in a weird way, is doing something similar to something we've become very good at in the post-Second World War world. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. It does, and uh, thanks for your time. Thank you for the question. All right, we have uh, the first question from the Zoom audience uh, before we go into the uh, next uh, personal audience uh, question here. And then second gentleman in line there, there'll be another question after you, before you from uh, our Zoom audience. So uh, the first Zoom question is from Major Jeff Andriliunas. I apologize if I butchered that pronunciation from the Army staff in the Pentagon. Um, the question is, are there any useful parallels or insights we can glean from the state of the Imperial Russian Army during the early 20th century leading up to the Bolshe Bolshevik Revolution and the state of the Russian military today? Over. Wow, good question. Um, you know, I, I, do think, I hadn't thought about it until the question, but I do think that, that it's, um, it's, and this is, this is a great example of how we might be able to use history to help us predict the future. It's always fraught with danger because there's a million variables that are different from the variables in, in a past situation, so you got to be really careful. But for those who don't know, in the First World War, the, the, the Russian imperial state before the First World War had been having all sorts of problems with revol revolutionary activities, uh, assassinations of uh, czars, which were their emperors at the time. And so when the First World War broke out, you had a state that was already dealing with internal problems. And of course, we all know that uh, a major war puts, puts and if you, if you were already on the boiling point, it turns up the heat even more. And the many defeats that the Russians suffered in that war destabilized the government, added to the amount of unrest, and once the soldiers on the ground, and I think this is what the question is sort of leading towards, once the soldiers on the ground turned against the regime, then what had been a problem involving revolutionaries turned into something where the army itself was in revolt or in danger of being in revolt. And I think that changes the whole equation. I think that you can see parallels today, and I do think that there is a danger to the regime there that if they continue to use their forces in a way that might be compared to cannon fodder, that there's a limit to what any army would put up with uh, in that sort of circumstance. I do think different armies have different limits, but I think, yes, I think I, think I do see a similarity. Like I said, first time I've thought about it, but I, I could easily see the circumstances where the conflict in Ukraine takes such a toll on the Russian military that just like the Russian military in the First World War, eventually they just decide they're not going to do it anymore. Now that doesn't mean they overthrow the government. In, in 1917, the Russian army often just stopped and they just refused to launch offensives. Uh, they, uh, at one point, I believe, going from memory here, at one point I think they just decided to sit on the defensive. They weren't gonna let uh, the central power military overrun them but they weren't going to launch offensives anymore, and that can quickly get out of hand. So I do see a parallel where one can envision um, the Russian military deciding that they're just not going to do this anymore, and what are you going to do? Shoot 100,000 Russian soldiers? Um, so yeah, I see a parallel there, and I can easily see, and I think maybe one can even make the case you already see the first little signs of this. You won't know that except with hindsight. But where if I'm the Russian leader, I would be very careful about pushing the military past where they were willing to go, especially if you're not seeing progress. I think most militaries are willing to absorb quite a few casualties. Um, you know, if you're taking Berlin and you're the Red Army in 1945, 
you're willing to suck up a lot more casualties than if you're the Russian military in 1917, and there seems to be no point to suffering all those casualties. So yes, I think the questioners uh, struck something here, and I do think you could see a similar situation. Hello, Mr. Carlin. Uh, my name is Special Lover. I'm a Swift student. Uh, prior to joining the Army, I was a high, high school district teacher for five years, so I just wanted to thank you for all the great content you put out. Uh, my question is about primary sources. Uh, today, it seems like with just the digital age, that there is just so many primary sources. Uh, the example I was thinking of is just the amount of video coming out of Ukraine right now. How do you think that changes how we study history 20, 30, 40 years from now versus what we study 30, 40 years prior to this? just based on how many sources there are now because of the digital age. Thank you. That's a great question, but let me, let me take it, just to, to create more of a contrast, let me go far earlier, right? So let's just talk about the Roman Empire or ancient Egypt or anything but ancient China. We used to describe it as the, the needle in the haystack situation. So once upon a time, if you're like looking at ancient armies, you're trying to find these needles in the haystack, and the needles are the primary sources and the little bits of information that you can extrapolate outward to, to try to create some sort of semblance of an understanding of the past. The problem reverses itself as you get closer to our time period, where there are so many things, the problem is trying to figure out how you wade through all the needles, right? We need more needles than haystacks. So um, I encountered this when I was doing the, the Blueprint for Armageddon series we did on the First World War. When I started it, I thought I could get away reading the traditional sources, right? Your British uh, uh, histories, your American histories, the traditional English sources. But what you discover as you go down that road is that every country that participated in the First World War and a bunch of countries that didn't participate have their own version of the story. So if you're going to give a 360 degree perspective on the First World War, you need to be incorporating all those needles, if you will. So as you get closer to the modern times, we're overwhelmed with needles. Like you said, how do you even begin to untangle all the strands in the rope that we have available to examine? And I think that's why, I think that's why, for example, when people ask me about the situation in Ukraine right now, I generally try not to comment on any specifics because I don't believe anything. And it's not because I don't think there's truth there, it's because I don't think during the fog of war, while the conflict is going on, while the propaganda is so heavy, while there is so much, um, if you will, uh, chaff amongst the wheat, it's going to take decades for us to figure out what the truth was going on there. And like my first World War thing, it's very possible that various different national sources, whether they're Russian, Ukrainian, American, uh, uh, or, or third parties that weren't even involved in the affair, it's gonna be difficult for us to figure out what we're seeing now. That's why, you know, they used to say journalism is the first draft of history, but you wouldn't want the newspaper accounts written during the war to make up the history because there's so much stuff that you're gonna figure out 10, 20, 30 years from now wasn't true, or you're gonna have a lot of the people involved in the story right now who are gonna give their perspectives years from now, and they may differ very differently from what they say today. Um, and so when you talk about primary sources, you're absolutely right. I think future historians have the exact opposite problem that they have when studying ancient societies. It's how do you wade through all the material and how do you separate the truth from the fiction? Um, it, but it's why I don't pay any attention to a lot of the stuff coming out of Ukraine right now, because I simply don't have enough information, enough confirmation, um, enough facts on the ground, and enough long-term zoom-out perspective to know what I'm looking at. So I think you nailed it from a, from a primary source perspective. Um, modern times overwhelms us with primary sources, and the farther back you go in history, it's exactly flipped. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, it does, sir. Thank you so much. Got you. But thank you for the question. Great question. So you're doing a great work being a high school history teacher. Thank you, sir. So we'll do, we'll do two in a row, just uh, by order of who was up first. Um, then we'll have a Zoom question and, and yours that might take us some time. But uh, so uh, ask your questions quickly, please. Um, and I uh, just want to let you know that uh, Jeff, the first Zoom questioner, said thank you, Mr. Carlin. That's um, awesome. <laughs> Thank you guys. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good 
Good afternoon, Mr. Crone. Uh, my question is regarding, uh, again, China with the Belt and Road Initiative, as well as you mentioned uh, American soft power in Africa. Uh, with us moving, it seems, into a, another scramble for Africa phase with uh, colonization and client states, uh, and given that, as one of the other uh, students in the past, regarding cultural memory, uh, with the memory of decolonization still not only being within cultural memory, but also living memory in Africa, do you see the potential for significant changes in borders on the map based on ethnic lines or more of a move towards uh, pan-African unity or a maintaining the status quo um, as that situation continues to develop? That's a very deep question, and I think, uh, and I think very germane. Uh, your point about colonization within living memory is acute and, and absolutely on target. I think one could easily make a case, and this is why we always point to the First World War as something, uh, as a watershed moment in history, because I think we are still ironing out some of the stuff that the First World War created, uh, and Africa's a perfect example of that. Um, I would, just my own opinion, I think Africa is still in a transition from um, a bunch of leaders, and the, this differs country to country, obviously, but there's a lot of places right now that are still on their way to being uh, someday what we might call functioning democracies that still have leaders who are either absolute dictators or warlords, I and mean, we still see a number of places um, uh, uh, where you have problems with, uh, uh, with warlords and their own private armies and all sorts of things. Um, I think we're on the way down the road to seeing this ironed out. I think it may take quite a bit of time. Uh, I don't know, not smart enough, not well informed enough to know how the impact of outsiders, whether it be the United States, China, or the former colonial powers in a lot of these places who still have quite a bit of sway in some of these countries, I don't know whether their influence is benign, positive, or negative. I think sometimes the influence props up some of these people in power that maybe would be better off going away. I don't know. Uh, I, I do think that the post-colonial uh, shaking out in a number of these places, uh, obviously, as, as we've seen, has been bloody and awful in a lot of these uh, territories. It's also been uh, extremely lethal when it comes to problems. I mean, Somalia is a perfect example. When you talk about the various famines there, a lot of those famines were caused by various warlords uh, interacting with each other. So I, I think, I'm not sure I would call the, the impacts of either the United States involving itself in these areas or China involving itself in these areas as a form of colonialism or neo-colonialism. Um, I do wonder about the, like I said, the impact of keeping regimes that might not otherwise stay in power in power. Um, I think we're in flux here. I think, you know, I like looking at the long view, and I think when you zoom out here, and, and we have another hundred years, I know that seems crazy, because you know, none of us are gonna be around to do this, but I think when you look at this in another hundred years, we're gonna be better able to put the early 21st century sub-Saharan African situation into some kind of perspective. But I mean, even look at the, the north of the Sahara area. I mean, look at Libya now. I mean, that's, that's a wonderful example of um, something where, you know, uh, Muammar Gaddafi is a post-Second World War um, uh, pan, I guess you could call him a pan arabist at one point, but, but uh, a, a nationalist leader who, when he falls because, uh, you know, outside pressure and, and, and whatnot, now we have a, a situation in Libya where it's, it's still quite destabilized. And it's going to take time for that to solidify. I, when you talk about African, pan African unity, I don't know what to make about that because I think something like that's a very interesting concept. But I haven't heard much about that kind of concept in a real, I mean, if, if you want to look at, for example, the 1950s and 1960s in, say, um, the modern Middle East, in places like Syria or North Africa with Egypt, when you had Nasser. And, uh, and, and the, the pan-Arabist sort of movement in, in that time period. That was the last time I think you saw a real, and again, maybe, maybe speaking way above my pay grade here, um, and somebody with more knowledge would contradict me, but it seems to me that there's a lot of talk and a lot of intellectual discussion about this, but in terms of like real political unification, the last time I feel like we saw that 
was uh, in the Nassau era. And I do think, and I don't think this will surprise anybody in, in the special forces um, uh, realm, that I do think that when those kinds of things start to coalesce, Outside powers have all sorts of interests at stake also. I'm not sure that outside countries love the idea of a pan-African sort of union or something. Um, and I don't know, but like, there's a reason that China is involving itself in Africa. There's a reason that we're involving ourselves in Africa. Um, and I think we would be fools to discount the fact that we're not there just to be um, there. Right? We're not there just to have deployable forces, because you have to ask yourself, well, why would we deploy forces? What sort of situations in Africa would make us want to put American lives at risk? Or, or um, you know, we've talked about how uh, China, for example, in the medieval time period would have had client states or allies or dependent states. So I think that modern attempts to try to do the same thing end up preventing that sort of a pan-African sort of thing. So. I would suggest that the question is above my pay grade and above my knowledge level. Uh, I think it's absolutely germane. I think it's a situation that 100 years from now we're going to be able to say was in flux during this time period. And I would also say that I am a huge fan of seeing a bunch of democracies rise up in that area and seeing, I mean, I think Africa reminds me of China in the 1940s in the sense that, you know, you almost have a sleeping giant here uh, where at a certain point, it's going to take its rightful place based on population, resources, land mass, and all that sort of thing uh, that it's been prevented from taking due to colonialism and, and you know, 400 years of history in that region. So uh, I, I would call it a, a China in waiting. Someday that's going to be a really, really uh, important, powerful zone. Um, and, and, I, and I don't know that we'll be able to decide what we're seeing now until we get there. Uh, does that make sense? Like, is that about my pay grade? It does, sir. Thank you very much. Hello, Mr. Hello. Hello, Mr. Carlin. Uh, I came up here with uh, machinations of asking a question related to uh, technological advancements in our current moment, but I figured I'd like to move and ask a question related to uh, Napoleon. Uh, do you think if Napoleon's fleet isn't absolutely demolished in 1805 that he keeps his eyes on uh, Britain with the possible invasion of Britain? Or do you think his push into Russia and the way that the war plays out is overdetermined there? Mm, great question. Uh, here's what I would say. I am not a believer that Britain is invadable. Uh, whether we're talking about the Second World War and Operation Sea Lion, whether, I mean, the last time Britain was conquered as famously in 1066, right? Uh, uh, the Normans, Hastings, all that. The Anglo-Saxon Empire overthrown. Um, that is a shit. We all know the English tale is a giant moat. And even if the British Navy couldn't prevent the French Navy from um, from from controlling that moat, uh, let me let me stop and say that Churchill had a wonderful line in the Second World War when they were perhaps worried about a German invasion. And the line was, I think he put it on posters, don't quote me on that, but I think it was a slogan. And the slogan was, you can always take one with you. And he was talking about if every citizen of London was able to take just one German soldier out, the Wehrmacht is gone, right? So, so I always think people think that if you could just beat the British Navy, control the English Channel, um, establish a logistical connection between the north of France and the south of Britain that you can pull the William the Conqueror. And I don't think, I mean, I think that's half the problem. Um, so, so I'm not a believer that Britain was conquerable, and even if the French are able to land on British soil, I think the problems just begin at that point. So I would suggest that the Trafalgar thing, even though that's how it's often portrayed, would not have meant that, that and one more, let me, let me even go to this point. I don't think Napoleon would have done it because I think he's too smart. I think he would have tried to sort of isolate Britain, cut off their allies, uh, maybe try to pull what the U-boats tried to pull in the First and Second World War, um, but I don't think he tried to invade Britain because I think he would have seen that for the trap it was, although he didn't see Russia for the trap it was, but let's give him some credit. 
We have Napoleon's example to use, and he didn't. He could have used the, the Swedish king, Charles XII's example, maybe, but, but you know, if you're Napoleon and you're looking at Sweden's capability and you control the vast majority of Europe at your disposal, you might think that you have the capability that he didn't. Um, I think Napoleon's example, though, should have warned the Germans off. But I think the Germans made a typical mistake that we all make in history, which is to assume that the lessons of history don't apply to us because the variables have changed, right? So even today, you might be able to say, well, we could invade Russia because we have aircraft, right? Napoleon didn't have aircraft or, or Hitler didn't have jets or whatever you want to say that, that allows you to uh, discount the lessons of history. I would say that land mass makes a huge importance. I mean, when you're talking about the United States, China, uh, India, uh, Russia, these are such huge land masses that I don't think technology or those kinds of variables makes any difference, right? The logistical distances involved and all that uh, are the overwhelming variables. In the same way that I think if you can manage to overcome the English Channel through Napoleon, I think your problems of invading and conquering Britain are still just beginning. So to answer your question, no, I don't think Trafalgar actually saved Britain in that sense, because I don't think Britain was in the kind of danger uh, maybe that we think it was. It would be hard for me to imagine um, the, the French Empire conquering Britain. Thank you, sir. Yeah, hard enough time in the peninsula, didn't they? All right, thank you, sir. Our uh, second Zoom question here. This is from Major Brandon Schwartz our Special Forces Underwater Operations or Dive School Commander down in Key West, Florida. Tough assignment, but someone has to do it. Uh, and Brandon asks, do you believe that the United States is currently on the path of hegemonic decline? And if so, what lessons from the past should we apply to forestall such a decline? And uh, if you're standing behind the first gentleman here, you probably will not get a chance because we're, we're going to come up to the end. But uh, uh, go ahead with that question, Mr. Carlin. Thank you. Well. I think that's an interesting question because I would say the answer to the question is yes, but I don't see that as a negative. Uh, I, this idea that hegemony is something that a free democratic state should try to have uh, strikes me as counterintuitive. I think the kind of, you know, um, I remember a phrase, I don't remember who attributed it to, uh, the United States was called an accidental empire or an unwilling empire. I mean, when you look at the end of the Second World War, the United States didn't necessarily seek to be this lone superpower. We just didn't have a war on our soil, right? Our industry wasn't demonstrated. We didn't get into horrific debt because of the war. So you're left in this position. And then you're, you know, there's this giant vacuum where sometimes you look at something like Korea in 1950, and when the North invades the South, there's this attitude of, okay, well, who's going to go help? And who's capable of that? And sometimes when you're the only one around, with, you know, we see this today, by the way, when, when you're the only one around with the capability, um, th there's this line from the superhero movie where the Spider-Man guy says, uh, if I don't act and bad things happen, it's my fault. Well, there are times when the United States, because of our ability to project power and all these sorts of things, become the only logical choice in circumstances where bad things are going to happen if we don't act. So when you look at the situation where the United States was in in 1945, where you're a he hegemonic power without necessarily ever having been that goal, right? I mean, the French Empire under Napoleon wants that. The United States, even though we pursue policies to maintain our level of dominance, doesn't necessarily, and certainly was never the national mission to do all these sorts of things. I think it's natural for the rest of the world. I don't think we're declining as much as the rest of the national, the rest of the world's catching up. Now, does that equal decline? Hmm. I think the difference between us and potential adversaries is shrinking, but I don't think that's because we're doing any worse. I think it's because the rest of the world's getting better. And I think, to be honest, a multipolar world is more the norm. The idea of hegemony is always something that seems a temporary thing, and I think a lot of countries go down this road of trying to preserve hegemony, and it ends up being the, the poison pill that ends up hurting them. So I think what we're seeing now, for example, the growth of China to me seems a natural thing. China's always been a world power. Look at the size of them, look at the resources, look at the population. It would be weird if they were not. The past hundred years of Chinese history is abnormal. So to see them rising up 
seems to me to be a restoration of normality in the long view sort of thing. If that means the United States is not quite as dominant as it was, it might be better to sort of um, resign ourselves to a return to normality rather than to artificially try to preserve something that post-1945 may have been an abnormal situation. Sir, that was um, fantastic. I think the book you were looking for is The uh, Accidental Superpower by uh, Peter Zion, another commentator that uh, a lot of us enjoy. Uh, next question. How are you doing, sir? I'm uh, Michael Chip, because I wanted to articulate myself. But my name is uh, Steph Parker Rodriguez, just a student here at SWIC. Um, my question is, uh, knowing the, the near-fear forces uh, that threat the U.S., this seems like it's a race for technology, uh, which changes the way that we look at warfare as a nation. Where do you see the implementation of ground forces, if any, aside from special operations facing these new threats, especially uh, in those, no, uh, those near peer fronts? Uh, I think that's a great question. Um, it, it depends. Um, so, for example, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm, I'm one of those people who believe using the old line, uh, never get involved in a land war in Asia. So I would suggest that ground forces in Asia is a great way to get your troops in trouble, uh, put them in harm's way. I would not put troops in Asia um, under any circumstance. I, and I mean the land, I, Japan's one thing, the Philippines are another thing, but uh, putting troops where the Chinese can get them, for example, would not be what I would do. I do see the danger of something in Ukraine where um, the United States might be tempted, depending on how things go in the future, to uh, put the equivalent of what you know we call tripwire forces right uh, into the region as a deterrent, or if not in Ukraine, then in some of the surrounding places. I mean, it would not strike me as completely beyond the pale to imagine somebody saying, "Well, we should put tripwire forces in the Baltics or in Poland or in Hungary." Um, I think that's a mistake too. Uh, uh, there's enough American forces in Europe already to, to, to fulfill, I think, that tripwire uh, um, capacity. Um, I, I don't see any good reason, to be honest, to do that. I think uh, the United States, maybe alone amongst the world nations, has the capacity to ferry and project troops and power if necessary. Um, I just think right now putting them in harm's way would be a mistake. And I think when you talk about um, the technological race. I think that's particularly interesting now when you look at, I mean, for example, look at the Taiwan Strait situation. I think we forget that, that there has not been a major war directly between major superpowers since 1945. There's been proxy wars, but the reason you have the proxy wars is because a direct war between major powers in a nuclear-armed world is inconceivable. And I think it should remain inconceivable. And when you look at something like China, the big danger here is we are absolutely forgetting, I'm sure they're not forgetting at the highest level, but the general public is forgetting about nuclear weapons and they're forgetting all the different ways that they can be used. I mean, for example, there's a lot of talk about um, the United States fleet operating in the Taiwan Straits. Uh, you know, there were a lot of tests done in 19, between 1945 and 1955 with what nuclear weapons would do to fleets. Uh, on the water. Um, a tactical nuclear weapon uh, launched at an American fleet in the Taiwan Straits. How do you even put this? When you have a revolution in military affairs, so let's look at 1914. The reason 1914, first year of the First World War, was such a shock to all the powers involved is because the general European powers had not had an all out war in almost 100 years, 99 years since Waterloo. What that means is tons of technological change has happened since the last time major powers have used the latest technology against one another. And so you can have all the war games you want today, we would say all the computer simulations you want, but you just don't know how the interplay of all those new weapon systems are going to interact with each other, right? So there's a ton of variables and a ton of uncertainty. That uncertainty should should be taken very seriously. The problem you get into, and the Rand Corporation and lots of other think tanks studied this when nuclear weapons were first invented, atomic weapons were first invented. What happens if a country tries to use that uncertainty to push their, their national policy goals? So for example, what if China says to us, we're going to take over Taiwan, and if you interfere, we're going to nuke you? 
What do you do in a situation like that? Or what if somebody just, what if, what if the Soviet, I mean, you need to stretch my age, what if Russia incrementally ramps things up and then dares you to do something about it? Are you willing to launch a nuclear strike because they go one step farther than they went yesterday? These are all things that have been discussed. There's a great book, by the way, called The Wizards of Armageddon. And it's a book about how the great, you know, the government got the greatest minds in the United States together to discuss all these questions about what do you do if this happens, or what do you do if that happens with nuclear weapons? And it's all academic until it's not. And I think what you're seeing here when we talk about these things is stuff that sounds like science fiction potentially happening. And I think once you want these, once the genie gets out of the bottle. You know, we talked earlier about how sometimes you can think you're pushing history and you have control of events and you can decide when and where you want to act. But just like in 1914, when countries were, were at one point controlling things and then all of a sudden they weren't, events can start pulling you. And then you're involved in a dynamic and then your, your, your range of options gets constrained and then you can find yourself in situations that nobody would have chosen to be in have you still had control? And I think the kinds of things you're just mentioning are exactly the sorts of dangers we face. And I'm worried about humanity's capacity to work within those sorts of parameters to not have a terrible accident happen. I think I, I, I've gone a little farther than your question, but I think about this a lot. I have no answers. I, I'm profoundly disturbed, and I'm worried that we take it a little bit less seriously than maybe you should. Thank you, sir. I think that's everybody's uh, main concern is what a lot of these. I think you. I think you guys think about it more than others too. Thank you so much, uh, sir. I, we're getting into our last ten minutes, so I apologize for anybody that was uh, in line, and uh, we had one more Zoom question that we uh, don't have time for. But first of all, just to uh, the audience here and uh, and on Zoom, thank you for the questions. I have to say, uh, having been an instructional leader at SWIC for a few years, it can be very difficult to get uh, good questions out of uh, a class or a group such as this. I think that's a testament to, uh, to Mr. Carlin and his ability to get people excited and interested in uh, the history of strategy and politics and international relations. Um, and the responses were, were just fantastic. So round of applause for yourself for asking great questions and for Mr. Carlin. Yeah, and before I, before I turn it over to you, uh, Mr. Carlin, for any closing remarks, I'll uh, offer General Beaupair, General Roberson, if you want to say anything to, to close us out. Yeah, on behalf of the whole United States Army Special Operations team, thanks. Thanks for what you're doing. We appreciate it. You've heard a lot of thank yous, but all of us are fans. You, you make us better. We appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. I'm sorry, I didn't even step on anyone. No, go ahead, Dan, please. Over to you. Why don't you do that? I was going to thank you all. And you know, you guys, and you know this, you guys are all sort of the tip of the spear. And when I think about people uh, blankly talking about putting you guys in harm's way, I always try to imagine if you guys were my kids. And when I would think it was okay to send my kids into harm's way and when I wouldn't. Um, I feel like I'm very hard on our political leaders sometimes because I, I don't think that they always think of you as our kids. And at the same time, I realize that we can't let the fact that you are our kids stop us from doing sometimes what we have to do. Um, I, listen, I, I'm, I'm worried about the future, but I'm always worried about the future. Uh, and I hope we keep looking at these things with the seriousness that they demand. I think that there's a number of, we didn't get into any of the, the talks about how dangerous the current situations are, but I want to use one more time that pulling and pushing metaphor to describe the fact that at some point, some of these circumstances can get out of our control, and then we could be in situations that nobody wants. And. Um, I would hate to see you guys involved in anything you didn't have to be involved in. And so I hope that we can, I hope the future looks brighter than I sometimes worry it does. Uh, I appreciate all that you guys do, and I'm so thankful for all the good questions and everything, and my goodness for listening. So I hope you all stay safe. Um, and I do, I think about you guys as my kids, and I wouldn't want you involved in anything that I wouldn't want my kids involved in.
thank you again for being here, Mr. Carlin. Thank you to everyone who joined us. That concludes our Major General Healy Distinguished Lecture Series event with Mr. Dan Carlin. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks again.